Welcome everyone, both Adam's Faithful and Heathen, to this week's sermon on those in the wasteland who seek the forbidden delicacy. No, we are not talking about Tide Pods, we are talking about human flesh. As horrifying as it is to think that people would do such a thing, the desperate state of the post-war world and the constant struggle for survival means that cannibalism is not nearly as rare as one would hope. People on the cusp of death have resorted to it. Groups have become addicted and created elaborate traps to satiate their hunger, and some have even undergone drastic physical and mental devolution as they become addicted to munching on their fellow man. Crank up the rads and let out your best bon appetit as we look at the cannibals of Fallout. The first ones I want to mention are really vague and generic, but they're worth pointing out if only because they stand in contrast with many of the other Fallout games that have specific cannibals or cannibal groups. Starting with Fallout 2, it doesn't have any specific groups of cannibals except for some that can be found in the northwest part of the map, where the Chosen One starts their journey, but these are limited to random encounters. These encounters just show poorly equipped and dressed people that attack the Chosen One out of desperation for a meal. Fallout Tactics only mentions cannibalism when learning of the faction known as the Beast Lords. We never learn of specific individuals who engage in this behavior, but it is a fairly well-known fact among many people. Fallout 4 is the last of the Fallout games that doesn't mention specific individuals or groups who engage in cannibalism. We hear stories of some raiders resorting to cannibalism when circumstances become dire, or the trappers at Far Harbor who found a lost synth trying to make their way to Acadia and decided to have a little snack. Those really are the extent of the references to cannibalism in those three games, which is pretty sparse and stands in direct contrast with the rest of the games with specific and often grisly and grotesque stories characters and groups that engage in the forbidden indulgence. Now let's get to the specific cannibals and we will start out with what I think are the tamest examples and work up to the worst of the worst. I base this on what they've done, how compelling their stories are and their overall impact on the wasteland. So starting with the small stuff, the tasty morsels if you will, and progressively working our way to the top in this multi-course meal. The first of a handful of Fallout 3 references that we will cover is not the craziest thing that is happening in the Capital Wasteland, but it's certainly memorable. A group of hunters can be encountered in a number of places pursuing a fleeing Wastelander or gathered around a recently deceased person. If encountered while hunting their prey, they will be hostile to the Lone Wanderer and force you to fight for your life lest you become the main ingredient for that evening's strange meat pie. If they are encountered after just having killed their prey, they will be found having a break and they won't be aggressive. In fact, they'll be friendly enough to do a little trading. All they have in their inventory is strange meat. And when asked further about this meat that somehow stands out among all the disgusting foods of the wasteland, they respond that it is the best meat in the entirety of the capital wasteland. Should you overstay your welcome, however, they will become hostile and look to field dress your backside. Although less explicit than the hunters, many of the swamp folk in the Point Lookout DLC can be found with strange meat in their inventories, and a strange meat pie can be found at the trapper shack, implying that cannibalism is a fairly routine practice among the irradiated and mutated peoples of former Maryland. Appalachia has no shortage of cannibals in real life and in Fallout. Just kidding. Or am I? Maybe this prevalence of cannibalism is partially due to how close Fallout 76 takes place after the events of the Great War. Taking place only 25 years after Adam blessed the world, it makes more sense that in the breakdown of society and subsequent scarcity of supplies and food, that some people would resort to cannibalism 
in the tumultuous years directly after the war, before a new equilibrium could be established with the survivors and the post-war world. At any rate, the player can come across the mountainside bed and breakfast in the Savage Divide region of Appalachia. It is run by a polite and otherwise rather unassuming couple, Hubert and Juliet, who only charge five caps per night and even provide a complimentary breakfast. However, under the surface of this suspiciously cheap business is an insidious secret. Juliet and Hubert are both being forced by a group of cannibal raiders to lure in unsuspecting victims to rest in a rented room where the customers are unceremoniously killed and turned into pot roast or something. Should the player pay the incredibly cheap five caps and rest, they will awaken from their rest to several hostile raiders standing just outside the door. The raiders have come out from the locked basement where they hide from any potential customers, but they're always close enough to threaten Hubert and Juliet. You are forced to fight your way out of the bed and breakfast, and it's up to you whether or not you forgive the owners of the bed and breakfast. Another raider group that is otherwise not known for any sort of cannibalism, the Blood Eagles, has two rival cooks who are constantly trying to outdo each other, even sabotaging each other to prove to everyone else who the superior cook is. While we don't know of specific instances of cannibalism, when they encounter the player, they will shout things like, fire up the grills, we're eating good tonight fellas, or who ordered takeout because it's here. Maybe this is just them trying to be intimidating, but this is Appalachia. We're not taking any chances. There is another known cannibal by the name Maximum Maddie, who was sold into slavery because she decided she wanted a kid's meal, and not the McDonald's kind. She is fated to fight in a raider fighting arena until the player beats her or the raiders detonate her collar because even they don't think she deserves to live. Fallout New Vegas does not shy away from man munching, and indeed it comes up a handful of times. The Jackals are an old raider group that emerged from Vault 15 like a handful of other early raider groups in California. By the time events are unfolding in 2281, in New Vegas and the surrounding Mojave, the Jackals are shadows of their former selves, their relentlessly selfish pursuit of basic survival, driving them to extreme violence, and even cannibalism. This makes them stand out as particularly grotesque among the other raider groups, which is an absolute feat because there are some real sickos out west. They have been hit hard by the NCR and are only found in scattered groups around the Mojave, their barbarism being their ultimate downfall. In a rather empty corner of the Mojave lies the research vault, Vault 22, now devoid of any human life. The vault focused on research related to high yield crops, advanced fertilizers, and even a special fungus that functioned as a pesticide. This experimental fungus from the Big Mountain Research Facility was so good at its job that it would infect all the researchers, killing many and mutating the rest into creatures known as spore carriers. When it became clear to the residents of the vault that there was no way to stop the spread of the fungus, many of them fled the vault and started to journey to find a new place to call home. They ended up quite far from New Vegas, in the beautiful Zion Canyon. Here they encountered a peaceful group of post-war survivors from Mexico. But these Vault 22 survivors, either through desperation or complete apathy, forcibly enslaved this group from Mexico, penned them up, and eventually ate them. This despicable act would cause one Randall Clark, an ex-military survivor from northern Utah, who silently watched over those in the canyon, to go on a campaign of revenge against the Vault 22 survivors where he attacked them with a small arsenal, sowing terror amongst the group, killing dozens upon dozens in the process, and convincing the Vault 22 survivors to leave the canyon lest they be killed by what they refer to as a vengeful ghost. Alright, it's time to supersize this messed up meal and get into the real meat of Fallout's cannibal lore. What better way than to go all the way back to the first game? 
a dark business agreement was struck between a man who goes by the name Bob and a wasteland doctor that goes by Doc Morbid. If that name isn't enough to make you think twice before enlisting his services, then you probably deserve what happens next. See, Doc Morbid is a legitimate doctor, and the Vault Dweller can go to him to be healed of almost anything except radiation poisoning in the settlement of Junktown. If you are somehow unable to afford his services though, things can quickly spiral out of control. Doc Morbid will have you escorted to his basement for processing so that you can start making good on your debt to him, and you are promptly faced by a dwarf named Gretch. Gretch is Doc Morbid's assistant, and his job is to extract payment, so to speak, from Doc Morbid's debtors, and he does that by chopping you up into itty bitty pieces. Usually the Vault Dweller will kill everyone in his attempt to get out, but depending on the choices that are made, Gretch and Doc Morbid can survive. But it's not over, even after you've narrowly escaped with your life. You can find clues by looking around the basement, or by speaking to Gretch as if you are in on the scheme, and find out who they are selling the human meat to. Gretch isn't what you would call a genius. You can find a suspicious man named Bob in a settlement farther south in a place called The Hub, where he is selling iguana meat. And you know, while not my thing, iguana meat is certainly not human meat, so it has that going for it. But along with selling whole cooked iguanas on a stick, he also sells what he calls Prime Choice Select, otherwise known as iguana bits. This meat skewer is made of the meat bought from Doc Morbid for pennies on the cap, and Bob is not ignorant of this fact. Bob can be directly confronted and will of course play dumb, but can be cornered by the Vault Dweller if they choose to press the matter. Two things can happen. Bob can rightfully be called out for his despicable act of selling human meat to those of the hub under the pretense that it is prime iguana meat at which point Bob will violently confront the Vault Dweller. Alternatively, the player can blackmail Bob and get a weekly cut of his earnings to keep quiet, just at the cost of a few reputation points per collection. There was a cut scenario as well where the player could inform the hub's sheriff of Bob's unethical business practices, at which point Bob would try and flee the city. The player could then go on a quest to apprehend Bob and bring him to justice. So while Doc Morbid and his crew may not be cannibals, and Iguana Bob himself may not be a cannibal, they are indirectly making many of the people in the hub that buy food from Bob's shack to become cannibals. I do also want to say, this picture from an ending cutscene for Fallout shows Iguana Bob trying to offer some of his Iguana bits. And just look at that face. Did it really take the Vault Dweller connecting all the dots for people to realize that this dude was into some real messed up shit? Look at that smile! Life pro tip from Rad King, you ever see a smile like that on someone's face? You run like Liberty Prime is trying to kill you. In the years before the Great War, a man by the name of Earl Williams lived in Appalachia, earning a living in the coal mines owned by Hornwright Industrial. Hornwright Industrial had an automation program to increase their coal extraction by several times, and the auto miners that they developed were very effective. They soon exhausted the coal seams, and the miners soon found themselves without a job. The mine that Earl had worked in was slated to close for good, but he and many other people knew of a bunch of supplies that were still in the mine, and they decided that they were going to go steal them. Under the cover of darkness, they entered the mine and were in the process of stealing some of Hornwright's supplies right from under his nose when the entrance to the mine was blown up, trapping everyone inside. All indications point to this being a terrible accident by the mine supervisor, who didn't know that a bunch of people were in there, but it's also awfully convenient. The trapped miners and townspeople had no way out and couldn't dig the debris out that was blocking the entrance. Faced with no food, it didn't take long for some of them to consider eating one of their group who had been injured in the mine collapse. Many of the group found the idea so detestable that they would rather die of starvation themselves rather than eat another human. And even Earl himself admitted that he didn't think it was right to eat another person. 
However, the hunger was too much to bear, and he reluctantly gave in, joining those whose desire to survive superseded everything else. As those of the group that refused to eat human died, they would become the next meal, and with every feast, some sanity would slip away. Eventually, Earl and the other survivors were not content with waiting until people would die before taking a one-way trip to Flavortown, and he could not recover from his downward spiral. Warped in the mind, his body started to follow suit to become one of Appalachia's most hideous and terrifying creatures, one that seems to be born from a person's continuous consumption of human meat, a creature known as the Wendigo. Earl would not become just any old Wendigo, although many that were trapped there did become normal Wendigos. No, something special about him would cause him to transform into a Wendigo Colossus. The Colossus is far larger than a normal Wendigo, with dark skin, extra appendages, and two extra heads. One sporting a beautiful sack of Wendigo juice or something. Earl and the smaller Wendigos that mutated over the course of 26 years in the mine can finally be put down for good when the player cracks open the mine with a nuclear bomb, which is Appalachia's favorite pastime, and ascends into the depths to try and find out what happened to Earl and the others. At the behest of Earl's daughter, Maggie, she survived the war and never stopped trying to find her father, asking anyone who will listen to try and help her. The player has the option to return to Maggie after the quest and tell her that no trace of him was found, or that only a pocket watch that can be looted off of Earl's body was the only thing that could be found. The most truthful option is to tell Maggie what happened to her father, his transformation into a monster, and subsequent death at the hands of the Vault Dweller. Not far from the mines that turned Earl into a nightmare beast, a man that went by the name Scoot was obsessed with hunting for cryptids. In pre-war Appalachia, there was no shortage of urban myths, legends, and their associated cryptids like the Mothman. Scoot and his friends would regularly go and look for cryptids out in the wilderness, and this eventually led Scoot to an old abandoned church known as the Sunken Church. In his earnest search for ghosts, Scoot was not paying close enough attention, and he fell into a large sinkhole, breaking both of his legs. This happened only days before the Great War, and being alone, hidden away where no one would find him, with his broken legs, he realized that he was going to die alone in this dark hole. To his surprise, the next day, a park ranger also fell down the hole, but he fared much better. The ranger's name was Kevin, and he helped to show Scoot how they could survive on moss and bugs while doing what they could to help his legs heal properly. Scoot and Kevin were trapped in the hole for three months before another individual fell down the hole and this man, Mickey, would change things for the worse. Mickey was a member of a raider group called the Gourmands, a raider group that was distinct from the other large groups that emerged in the post-war era because of their desire to engage in cannibalism. Mickey choked Kevin to death in his sleep and told Scoot that the only way they were going to survive was to eat Kevin, which Mickey happily did. Scoot was far less sure, but finally gave in to the pressure, and although he felt awful about it, he ate Kevin. Details are sparse, but Scoot developed a hunger, THE hunger, that gave him the motivation and strength to kill Mickey at some point as well, consuming him and justifying it by saying that Mickey and Kevin were both weak and had to die to ensure the strong survived. This was a transformative event for Scoot in many ways. He no longer wanted to leave his hole. He had a new purpose. He felt like a new person. He would wait in the sinkhole for the weak to fall down and build his strength by consuming their bodies. This cannibalism and isolation transformed Scoot into a Wendigo, who at the time of Fallout 76 is still found in the hole that he refused to leave. Speaking of the Gourmand Raider group, their story is pretty crazy, which one would expect of a group of, quote, chefs, whose primary interest is in eating others. 
The Gourmands were actually one of the original five large raider gangs that formed shortly after the Great War in Appalachia. These raider gangs all separated on lines that made them distinct from one another, and the Gourmands, well, I hope this is obvious by now, but they stand out for their particular culinary interests. The Gourmands eventually settled in an area called Bolton Greens, but it didn't take long before there started to be mysterious and inexplicable disappearances of some members. Although there were some suspicions that someone in the group was cannibalizing their own, there was no proof of who had done it, and such a thing was explicitly against their group's code. The proof would eventually manifest itself, and the killer would be none other than the group's leader, Morris Stevens, and his wife Edie. For breaking the Gourmand's code of not eating each other, which is like literally the lowest bar ever, Morris and Edie were banished from the group and left, finding refuge at the Wendigo Cave. The former leaders would make a life of ambushing people along the nearby road. All the while, their mental states were slipping and they began eyeing each other, waiting to see which of the two would be the first to make a move against their spouse. Back at the raider camp, things were more or less the same. Two members named Bill and Cantu argued over whether men or women tasted better, and another person named Jerry would engineer a special room that allowed them to store the meat that they harvested in a way that would not attract super mutants or mole rats. The normal cannibal life would take quite the turn though when their old leader Morris would make a return in a terrifying new form. Morris's mental state and physical state devolved to the point that he killed his wife and ate her, with a holotape recording his words and reaction shortly after committing the dark deed. Since I can't do it justice, I will let Morris describe it in his own words. Edie, darling Edie, oh, how delicious you were. The sweet taste of your flesh is as it passed down my throat. Oh, the syrupy warmth of your blood as it filled my stomach. Dear Adam Above, that is gruesome. Maybe it was this single act that finally broke Morris, because not long after this, he became a Wendigo. In fact, he is considered the progenitor Wendigo, which would seem to imply that all Wendigos are somehow descended or related to him, which we know isn't exactly true, because Earl was in the middle of his own transformation into the Wendigo Colossus back at the Hornwright's Mine. Regardless, Morris would terrorize his old gang as a wendigo, killing and consuming them, as well as any other raiders he came across. He was so terrifying and brutal that a bounty was put on his head, with a sizable reward going to whoever could stop this man-hunting monster. The reward would go unclaimed, as events killed or drove off all humans in the Appalachian region, and we never truly know what happened to the Gourmands. Were they all killed by Morris? Were they, as some other raiders have surmised, all victims of self-cannibalization? Or did the scorched plague wipe them out? Some Appalachian mysteries may never truly be solved. In Fallout 3, there is a group that lives in the shadows, venturing out to randomly attack victims and slip away before anyone can stop them. Known as the family, this group is led by a well-known charismatic leader who inexplicably only has a charisma stat of three. Seriously, look it up if you don't believe me. Going by the name Vance, he recognized at a fairly early age that he had a compulsion for human flesh, and as a result, left his home at Rivet City. He attracted a following of people who had the same yearning for man flesh, and under his leadership, they became the family. What sets the family apart, however, 
is that they are somewhat reformed cannibals. Vance has convinced them all that they should not actually engage in full-on cannibalism in the form of eating meat, but instead opt for drinking blood. Rather than being raving, bloodthirsty vampires, as they like to refer to themselves, they only kill as required to get the blood that they consume in lieu of actually consuming the body. The family has recently been targeting a nearby settlement called Arafu, and as luck would have it, one member of this community suffers from the hunger himself. Ian West is a young man who one fateful day was guarding the settlement's Brahmin with his sister when an aggressive individual approached and violently shoved Ian, causing him to slam his head into the ground. Ian came to soon after, but was full of sudden and inexplicable bloodlust, where he pounced on the intruder and tore the man's throat out with his teeth. This was the beginning of his sudden cannibalistic tendencies, and this eventually led to him killing both of his parents in some sort of violent outburst that was fueled by his dark desires. Rather fortuitously, this event transpired when Vance and the family were close by Arafu, and they were able to convince Ian to leave and join their group since they shared a common trait, and he really had nothing left for him in Arafu. They were even nice enough to make it look like the family had done it instead of him. It is up to the Lone Wanderer how to resolve the number of issues between the terrified settlers at Arafu, the family and their practice of harvesting people for their blood, and Ian, specifically whether he should remain with the family or try and make amends for his past deed and rejoin Arafu, or try and make amends with his past and leave the family. Should a peaceful resolution be found, the citizens of Arafu can be convinced to provide the family with blood packs, which are somehow fairly common items that can be found in the wasteland 200 years after the Great War. The family will cease their attacks and instead just drink the blood provided in the blood packs, while also agreeing to help protect the settlement from any other threats. The Lone Wanderer will be taught the fine art of blood drinking and receive the Hematophage perk which causes the player to heal 20 HP from blood packs, which is a lot more than the 1 HP that they otherwise heal for. While the deeds of the family may not be as gory or horribly violent as many of the stories we have and will look at, I find their approach interesting. They try to regulate their consumption both in volume and food type, and are willing to make mutually beneficial deals with other groups. They are just so unlike every single other group of cannibals in any and all Fallout games that I rank them higher just for being an interesting deviation from the norm. In Virginia, or what's left of it anyway, in 2277 lies the idyllic town of Andale. Okay, maybe it's not idyllic by our standards, but by the standards of the Capital Wasteland, it is certainly up there. Two families live in the town and seem to be living the best lives possible. Their two children are best friends. The husbands are busily engaged in the family business, and the wives are happy homemakers. They are all quick to tell the Lone Wanderer, when they first come to the small town, that they are patriots. That Andale is the best town in the whole wasteland, several years running, and they will loudly proclaim the importance of voting, so long as it's not for beatnik commies. Their extreme kindness, friendliness, and outward happy appearances are in stark contrast with the bleak wasteland. And if it wasn't so extreme, one could actually believe that they are really living the best existence of anyone in the capital region. However, not all is as it seems, since Old Man Harris, the surviving grandparent that lives alone in one of the three houses, will waste no time in telling the Lone Wanderer that they need to get out. When questioned, he will explain that Andale is a dangerous place and that if they needed any proof to break into the locked shed or Jack's locked basement in his home. Of course, how could you not after everything you've heard from all the other residents? Breaking into the shed or basement will lay bare their terrible secret. They are a settlement of cannibals, luring in travelers and lulling them into a false sense of security with their kindness, only to attack them when they least expect it and take them to the shed to butcher them. Leaving the shed or basement will cause Jack and the others to directly confront the player, 
since they have been waiting just outside. Now that the cat is out of the bag, the Lone Wanderer has a couple options. They can call them the sick puppies that they really are, which will cause them to aggro and result in the death of all but the children and Old Man Harris. Alternatively, using a speech check or the cannibal perk, should the player have it, can convince the inhabitants of Andale that they don't judge them for what they've done. An understanding is born from a sly wink and a nod, and Jack will tell the Lone Wanderer that they are welcome back to Andale at any time, where the player can enjoy one of his wife's famous meat pies. Yum. It is worth pointing out that not only are they cannibals, but they also only marry amongst their two families. So they ain't just cannibals, they're incestuous cannibals. Roll Tide. Should the player rightfully put the families down, Old Man Harris understands our actions and will care for the two young children, promising to not continue the horrible traditions that the families have been practicing for generations, which is about the best ending we could hope for in this situation. Andale is such a memorable location because of how eerie the town and its inhabitants are. The residents seemed ripped straight out of Leave it to Beaver, are overly friendly, and almost seem oblivious to the destroyed world around them. And this is in large part due to their desire to strip travelers of their sense of security so that they can shove them into a meat pie. Finding their awful secret and being confronted about it is such a memorable event as their sickly sweet demeanor comes entirely into focus, knowing that it's all a show to get you on some meat hooks. And it makes for an experience that is hard to forget. The number one spot on this list, hands down the most unique, memorable, sinister, and most fun to experience from a game perspective, goes to the one and only White Glove Society. The White Glove Society can be found in the Ultra Lux, Ultra Lux, in the New Vegas Strip in Fallout New Vegas, and looking at how highbrow and posh this casino is, it is somewhat of a shock to learn that the White Gloves evolved from a primitive tribe. Mr. House, the business magnate that saved Las Vegas from nuclear devastation and reformed the city into a sliver of its former self, made a deal with a large tribe that were hidden away in subterranean caves that only emerged to hunt men for sustenance. The group were forced to leave their cannibalistic ways and their old tribal name behind, and in return, they would get Mr. House's blessing to create what would become the Ultra Lux. Inside the casino are a number of masked workers and servers dressed in Wasteland's finest dresses and tuxedos, which was dictated by one of the founders who instituted a rule that no one on the strip can be said to dress better than them. There are a few key characters in the story of the White Gloves and their dark secret, because not everyone in the group are actually cannibals. In fact, most aren't. Mortimer is the right-hand man of the White Glove Society leader. Marjorie, and he feels that the society has strayed too far from their roots. That isn't a widely accepted opinion, however, as even Marjorie herself does not condone cannibalism, nor does she ever want the White Gloves to return to that lifestyle. Mortimer, therefore, has to work in the shadows, hiring assassins to kill those that might interfere with his plans to reinstate cannibalism, and working closely with other key people, like head chef Felipe, to secretly feed the members a meal made of man. When the courier first arrives at the Ultralux, front and center is a man that sticks out like a sore thumb with his cowboy hat and western attire. Heck Gunderson is a wealthy Brahmin baron who came to the Ultralux to negotiate with them regarding beef sales when his son, Ted, went missing. The courier is asked by Heck to see if he can find his son and so the quest beyond the beef begins. The courier can talk to a number of White Glove members to try and find out what might have happened, and in so doing learn that another person had gone missing, this time a bride, and it is hurting the reputation of the resort. The courier eventually speaks to Mortimer, the maitre d' of the Ultralux, and this is where we have to make some decisions. If the courier has evil karma, or has the cannibal perk themselves, they can get Mortimer to divulge his plan to underhandedly return the White Glove Society to their former ways. Mortimer has kidnapped Ted Gunderson, mistaking him for someone else and intends to cook him up and serve him at a special feast, where unknowing White Glove members 
will eat this new mystery meat dish, and afterwards, it would be announced what it was that they ate. Mortimer believes this will cause people to no longer consider the practice taboo, since they just all did it, and the dish's deliciousness would make everyone want more. To bring the White Gloves back to their former glory, he goes to great lengths to make this plan come to fruition. This includes assassinating a White Glove member named Chauncey, who knows of Mortimer's plans and wishes to foil them. Felipe, the complete douche of a head chef, is in on the plan and will kill Ted Gunderson, who is being kept in the kitchen cooler, and cook him up into some super fancy French meat pies, unless the courier intervenes. The developers put a lot of thought into this quest, and it can be accomplished in many different ways, where you can foil Mortimer's plan, help Mortimer but convince him to kill someone else instead of Ted Gunderson, go through with Mortimer's plan, and at the last moment, make fake human meat pies and serve those at the feast instead, or you can help Mortimer kill Ted and frame his father, Heck, as his murderer. Going this route leads to Heck being killed during his arrest by a Securitron, and the player can be rewarded by one of Heck's Brahmin ranching competitors. It is also possible for the player to do the ultimate backstab if they help Mortimer reintroduce cannibalism to the society. If Mr. House is informed by the courier that the society has restarted their cannibalistic ways, he will give the player complete freedom to deal with the society as they see fit, and you can go back in and kick their mask-wearing, cane-wielding cannibal asses. The complexity of the quest with the white gloves, the number of outcomes, and the number of ways that you can resolve all the conflicts is exactly what you hope to find in a Fallout game and can keep multiple playthroughs fresh since you can try something new each time. The White Glove Society is also extremely memorable with their high brow aesthetic, pompous and often downright insulting attitudes and interactions, with all of this contrasting with their dark origin and secret attempts to return to the most disgusting of behaviors. The White Glove Society is one of the highlights of an already incredible game, and one that I will never tire of replaying. For all these reasons, the White Glove Society is the best of a list of very interesting, very compelling, and very horrible cannibals in the Fallout series. What are your favorite cannibals in the Fallout series? I want to hear what your favorites are in the comments, and whatever else you'd like to tell me. I think it's interesting that cannibalism was referred to generally in the first games until Fallout 3 when we started to get very specific groups and individuals whose cannibal habits are core parts of their individual quests and identities. And the series since has made cannibalism more visible and specific. Thank you to my wonderful patrons, who I am glad to report do not engage at all in cannibalism. Well, I'm pretty sure. like. 87% sure, there are some pretty sussy ones. If you are not a cannibal, then you can also support me on Patreon or YouTube memberships, and I would be incredibly grateful. Walk in Adam's glow, take care of yourselves, and I will see you soon.